We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Thank you very much for joining, uh, joining our uh, workshop, uh, bringing practical tools to the global community to secure ICT supply chains. Um, this session is organized by Geod Sigref Kaspersky as co-chairs of the Paris Call Working Group and by ORF America. And my name is Arne Dechou and I'm public affairs manager at Kaspersky. Um, as you know, cyber attacks against ICT supply chains are massively increasing today. Uh, we have seen uh, in the media of the last month some examples. And to counter this threat, uh, some good solutions already have been proposed uh, and implemented in different regions. However, we lack a common uh, response framework that is shared and implemented by every concerned stakeholder across the globe. So the objective of today's session is precisely to discuss the finding and to get your feedback, your own fresh ideas, um, of the working group on ICT supply chain that was created within the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace. So to kick off uh, right away uh, the session, I would like to give the floor to Ambassador Henri Verdier, who is the Ambassador for Digital Affairs of the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs. Um, so it's a pre-recorded video. Um, and I will ask my colleague Nastia to start the broadcast, if possible. Yes, in a second. Hope you will be able to see this. Dear all, I'm very happy to open this meeting. Today, the working group of the Paris Call, dedicated to reinforce the security of the ICT supply chain, will present the outcome of its works. Before entering the substance, I first want to thank Ogeri from Research Laboratory Geod, Anastasia Kazakova from Kaspersky, and Clara Morlier from Sigres. They have dedicated a lot of time and effort to gather the Paris Call supporters involved in Working Group 6 and to bring this report to life. I take also this opportunity to welcome the commitment of women in cybersecurity and to address a warm nod to Marion Cochet and Caroline Timor of the French team. As you know, the Paris Call has become the largest multi stakeholder initiative in the world since its creation in 2018. We now have more than 1,200 supporters, including 80 states, more than 700 private companies, and close to 400 civil society organizations from all regions of the world. The United States and the EU have announced that they joined the Paris Call last November during the Paris Peace Forum, which shows the appeal of the multi stakeholder spirit of the call. Welcome. But the Paris Call is not just about the number of supporters. It's also about how these supporters can cooperate together and develop concrete initiatives. The report produced by Working Group 6, as well as the reports prepared by the Paris Call's other working groups, demonstrate that the commitment of the multi stakeholder approach can produce substantial proposals to strengthen security in cyberspace. Here, I want to reiterate my thanks to Gerard Kaspersky and the CGREF for the outstanding work of this report, and extend my thanks to, also to all the Paris Code supporters who were involved in the first various working group. I want to say that this report on strengthening the ICT supply chain security is particularly complete and informative. I invite all of you to read it. Is available on the Paris Call website. It aims at showing factors leading to success and failure in the implementation of the initiative, as well as roles and responsibilities of different stakeholders groups in achieving ICT supply chain security. The report shows that firms have a major role to play in this end, which has been the deep conviction of the Paris Call right from the inception. 
Governments have also an important role to play to develop certification schemes and to develop regulation practices based on risk analysis. Among many other ideas, this working group's report is providing concrete and precise ideas to reinforce the ICT supply chain security, reflects on ways to improve firm transparency on their products, as well as on their cybersecurity policies and on the way to harmonize the security of cyber products for them to be certified internationally. The report also insists on the implementation of security by design policies and develop clear end-of-life policies for softwares and products for which updates are no longer available. It also incorporates vulnerability analysis and to value cyber researchers' works on the matters. I am deeply convinced that this working group delivered on its mandate, which was to provide Paris Code supporters with concrete tools to improve cybersecurity. The tools are there to be designed. The proposals will nurture France's action on cyber diplomacy, such as its proposal, together with 53 other states, to establish a UN cyber program of action which will be key to advance the implementation of international cyber norms, to make progress on issues such as cyber capacity building, and to encourage multi-stakeholder cooperation of cybersecurity issues. Without further delay, I am now leaving the floor to the panelists, and I thank you again for this opportunity to share my complete satisfaction and my happiness about this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Verdier. Um, and we will now go to Arnaud Coustier um, for an introductory keynote. Um, Mr. Coustier is president of the French Club uh, for Cyber Excellence um, and also a representative of the CIGREF, the Association of Large Companies Involved in Digital Transformation. So at search, Mr. Coustier has been co-chairing the working group over the last month. So the floor is yours, Arnaud. Hello, good evening, everybody. Dear friend, I am very proud to be here today. I consider that some part of the digital world is today a true common goods. When the same system are used by billions of people, it is not only technology, but common goods. And for that, security is essential. As former French cybercom, then former French Minister of Defense, CIO, I have deal with the two faces of the digital world. One to permit progress and development, other to be protected against all sorts of bad guys. Very proud also with the confidence of the SEGREF organization that gather more than 150 important French companies that give me the opportunity to coordinate with Kapersky this working six, this working group number six on the supply chain. The current context of deterioration of the situation leading to chaos if we do nothing today, the cyber attacks which are multiplied by four which only increase each year. The capacity of cyber criminals is growing faster than the capacity of victims to protect themselves. The impact of the latest supply chain attacks, solar wind, was obviously edifying. The need for a paradigm shift for all actors in view of the situation, the current articulation of roles and responsibilities must be changed very quickly. This leads SEGREF to set up a multi-stakeholder working group on the subject within the framework of the Paris Appeals with Kaparski, Zeod, but also all the community of supporters of the Paris Appeal. The multi-stakeholder nature of the Paris call will be emphasized with actors from different backgrounds and profiles, academics, private, vendor side, users, civil society organizations, including in terms of geography, 
Many Europeans, bold as so, participants for the North America and representative for the Asia and Africa regions. A few words of the organization of the working group. The participants meet for March or October every month on the subject through several work areas. Today, we publish a report on the occasion of the Paris Peace Forum last 12th of November. The work is based on the OECD works as a report of strengthening digital security of products and services, published in February 2021. So, the work was positioned in the direct line of the conclusion. Your work, with, your, your work is also the reference base of other in, existing initiatives at the European level of the European Commission, the Zenova Dialogue, at the United States level with a nice presented both in your panel without bearing exhaustive, of course. The issues and challenges of securing the supply chain identified in the world, awareness, transparency, and information sharing, risk management, responsibility of each actor in the digital chain, cooperation and governance at national and international level, innovation. Challenge in terms of regulation, institutional, political, market, and economic dimension, technical, so. Globally, here are a few of your here are a few of your recommendations from serving the security of this ICT supply chain. As two participants went for very different backgrounds, we managed to reach a consensus of the action to be implemented by actors. All actors have a key role to play. Everyone has to take their responsibility in this area. It is a common good. The working group has created a matrix of action area by actors based on the main principle of the OECD recommendation and the analysis of the current situation. We have converged of the need to strengthen regulatory and industrial approach and to harmonize them to avoid fragmentation. This is a case in particular with regard to product certification. It is necessary to develop product safety certification so that it can be effective over time and adapt to technology change. Other actions such as creating incentives for responsive behavior on both the supply and demand side and further improving the transparency of the digital supply chain by the public and private sectors. We together calls for everyone to take effective responsibility from governments, national and especially international regulatory bodies, product and service providers who must implement security by design practice and respect common security standards. Finally, it is a big challenge. CGREF ACO finally CGREF also calls for the development of an international cyberspace law with a dedicated governance. Like for like from the Montego Bay Convention of the Law of the Sea, with a clean whale for my long experience in the Navy, but on the digital world, it will not have 300 years to define this uh, international law. We have only a very few number of years. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Arnaud, for this introduction and sharing your own experience. So the session will be divided into two parts. Um, and for the first part, we want to propose you to dig into the, the findings of the, the working group that we just mentioned. Um, so I will uh, give the floor to my colleague, Anastasia Kazakova. Anastasia is Senior Public Affairs Manager at Kaspersky uh, in charge of cyber diplomacy. And she will give the interview of Aude uh, Jerry, uh, postdoctoral fellow uh, at GEOD and uh, co author of the report. So, ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Arnaud. Um, I'm actually right now a little bit sad that I'm not in Poland because you look really, really nice in the room um, with, lots, with lots of this lighting, professional lighting. It's really good to see everyone here. Um, I've been also part of the working group, but the idea presenting of the results, we wanted to actually. 
um, to highlight what you need to learn from the working group six. It's quite lengthy. Uh, we know that everyone definitely has lots of the read and a lot of the documents to digest. But today, our task would be in two, uh, 22 minutes to share the key outlines and the key ideas that we worked in with the lots of the organizations, more than 30 organizations, representing different regions, different backgrounds. And I'm really happy to ask all of these questions to Oat right now and be sort of as a neutral interviewer. Um, and he actually many probably ideas that we didn't have the opportunity to discuss with the Oat in the past. Um, so my first question would be, if to describe the working group six and the final report probably in three bullet points, what would be those key statements and the bullet points? Uh, what do you think of? Thanks, Nastia, and Arno, and hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet, uh, to see those of you that I uh, that I know and to meet uh, those of you that I don't know. Unfortunately, I wasn't uh, able to come to Poland, but uh, it's still great to be able to convene, even if it's only on Zoom. So to answer your question, Nastia, maybe I would say just in one word, that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> so what, what we did in the working group is really try to not duplicate all the amazing work that uh, has already been done. Um, Arno mentioned the OECD report. Uh, we have someone as a, here from the Geneva Dialogue, and I'm sure that he will share um, more information about, uh, about this. And so our main goal was not to duplicate existing and ongoing work, work but to build on this work and try to close what I would call the fragmentation gap. And I think we, you know, fairly succeeded uh, in doing so, uh, whether it was uh, on the three different uh, work stream, the three different work streams that I'm sure we will go through later uh, of the working group. Um, because we truly wanted to you know, show that many existing frameworks, uh, there are many existing frameworks that we need more um, harmonization and cooperation between all different actors. And we also wanted to provide guidelines to all of us that are involved in one way or another in uh, ICT supply chain security. And to do this last thing, we didn't want to provide more recommendations on what to do concretely. Um, this has already been done in many uh, different frameworks, but we wanted to help uh, the different stakeholders identify what should be done at different levels and uh, for different uh, concrete actions. And that was uh, the last part of our work, the action areas uh, of stakeholder groups gap. And I think, again, we managed to, to, um, to do that. Thank you so much, Ot. Um, and again, it's really so fresh to, to hear only you today and actually um, hearing what you think, um, being also a part of the really in a unique position, providing analytical support to both organizations coming from different backgrounds. Um, but it was really, really and a good and an interesting answer to this first question. Um, you were really um, good at highlighting that ICT supply chain security is getting really at a hot topic, if I could even say so, um, especially since the latest security events that have been triggered the VADA industry and the government's intentions to ice to supply chain security. So there are lots of the initiative in a, through different lands are going on in different parts of the world. If, speak, if to speak about the results of the working group six and the report, why should we first of all to learn about this report? What are the key results that we actually, as our future readers, readers and recipients, need to take in mind while opening this report. Well, there are a lot of things to learn from um, the report. The first thing maybe is uh, that a lot of things exist. Uh, there are a lot of ICT supply chain security frameworks. Uh, uh, some are uh, only you know, led by states. Some are uh, public-private partnerships. Some are initiatives from the private sector or from uh, non-profit organization civil society but there are a lot of things out there and 
if you really want to try to, to work on that and to improve uh, your, uh, the security of your supply chain, then there are many different frameworks you can uh, go to. That's the first thing. So we have a, a profusion of, um, um, of provisions of recommendations. Um, the second point is that we have a lot of things, but they are so widespread and it's a bit hard to know exactly what to do. And I think whether we look at regulatory frameworks or um, public private frameworks, in many cases, uh, what we saw in uh, when we did the mapping of our work, when we studied all these different frameworks, is that there is a lack of information about what to do exactly, to who should we go if we have any questions. And so one of the biggest, uh, one of the main points that I would recall is, that I would take from this work is, a lot of things has to do about raising awareness. And it's not only about raising awareness on the topic of ICT supply chain security and how important it is, but it's also about raising awareness um, on what are the uh, legal obligations, what are the recommendations, who are the, uh, what are the uh, uh, designated and competent authorities that deal with uh, this issue. So it's mainly more about being more transparent, more uh, about being clearer, so everybody can uh, play its role and um, ensure its uh, ICT supply chain security. Maybe another point uh, that uh, really struck me is, I mean, I knew about that, but working, uh, doing the work on the action, the matrix of the action areas is that we're all responsible. When you look at the three co-chairs of uh, the working group, you have um, a company uh, on the supply side, uh, uh, you have a, a non-profit organizations uh, convening users and you have an academic. And I mean, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't be more different, but we all have a role to play if we want to ensure ICT supply chain security. And if one of us, I would say, so one of I and us, it's of course broader than just the three of us, doesn't do, doesn't play its part, then it collapses. And I think the uh, matrix uh, at the end of the report really shows that you know we can ask states to do more, we can ask uh, private companies and especially on the supply side to do more, but users also have a role and the demand side also, have, uh, also has a role. International organizations also have a role. And so we all need to work uh, to, together. And again, I think it shows that we must uh, work all together. So that would be the three main points that I would uh, take from the report. I really, really liked this part um, because indeed being, and I call it for multi-stakeholder participation and discussion, this is actually presumes quite a huge responsibility to be open, to stay open, to heal lots of the different diverse views with where you can actually probably will, wouldn't be agree with everyone but it's really important to hear everyone in the room and in the working group six, I also remember working on the accountability matrix, which we initially framed, but then decided to um, make it softer. And I, I was in, among those people who actually call it to make it a little bit softer too, because we understood that it would be so many different views in the IC supply chain security to understand who is actually the most accountable or responsible to um, increase the security of products that we all increasingly rely on. So it was a really good point. Um, the next question, which I really like to highlight, because this is something that really important for us as the company, it's about the fragmentation. It's really important to many users, how to still make sure that we would continue consume the globally produced technology and while we see different emerging regulatory and industry approaches to regulate and secure our technology, how to make sure that they will not be so much fragmented and thus would actually uh, place the further burden on the user shoulders. Um, how do you see this risk um, coming from the academia and from the sales society perspective? Well, I would say that, you know, even if to be honest, we don't want to think about uh, the uh, the uh, how difficult it might be for 
the private sector to navigate uh, within all these different uh, legislations. Um, if we don't have uh, a strong ICT supply chain security, it's the resilience of our societies that is being threatened. So it's not just about providing legal security also for, for companies for the supply side, it's really about, it's broader than that, and it is a big emergency and societal, social, and economic uh, uh, requirements and emergency that we, we're facing today. So now what, um, I would say two different things to, to answer your questions. The first one is uh, a lack of transparency and access to the, to the legislation. I remember, I think it was my first or second day at law school. Um, we have this course on the introduction to what is uh, law, what are the big principles. And, you know, one of the main, one of the first thing they tell, they tell you is about uh, access to the legislation. And I mean, whatever the subject, it's so difficult to access the legislation and to know exactly what your obligations are. So even before, you know, starting thinking about uh, new regulations or harmonization across different regulations, it's about being clear. And it is, I would say, the responsibility of the state to, you know, make sure that all of you know, those that are concerned by a city supply chain security know what their obligations are, know about all the good practices. So it would first be about transparency. And the second thing it would be um, harmonization and interoperability between uh, different legislation. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the fragmentation and the impact of fragmentation on the on international peace and security. So if we have different um, level of requirements, then we might have, uh, you know, less security in the ICD supply chain. So it is again the resilience of our societies that will be threatened. So states need to work at the international level to, to improve that. Uh, we see that the OECD is conducting uh, great work on this, on this, but the OECD again is not um, uh, convening all states uh, across the world. Um, what we can hope for is that uh, once they produce some guidelines and recommend concrete recommendations for state, they will be implemented by the member states of the OECD and that it will have some kind of uh, uh, broader effects, spillover effects uh, on non-member states. So we, so all states, uh, you know, grow together uh, in this matter. Thank you, Wood. And probably on the last and the final question is the body action areas, which you already touched on. So definitely industry that produces technology have lots of the um, responsibility and a huge role to contribute to the secure, uh, greater security of the products. We also discussed about the role of the governments, help with the enforcing and also helping with clarifying the institutional framework and making the um, the legal landscape also more transparent and understandable to the market agents. What about the users? Um, sometimes it's getting a more, more, we could more and more often that the users also play a role in securing the, uh, making sure that throughout supply chains, the security stays actually um, with less security impact on others because users is, are the ones who may apply the patches, the users actually need to follow the exact functionality of the product and do not use it in some unusual functionality where the vulnerabilities might be exploited. So how do you see this balance of different stakeholders and what's the role for the, for the end users in this accountability or the action um, areas matrix? Well, of course, I think the, uh, the, the suppliers uh, play uh, a super important role uh, in ICT supply chain security. Um, I think that they have the power to connect uh, because that because of the products and services uh, that they are providing. They are just going there. They have the power to connect the world uh, to make uh, businesses uh, to make um, activities going on even uh, in time of a pandemic, as we saw uh, last year. And this is a huge power. And with huge power comes great responsibility. And I like the uh, the phrase because 
I think it tells everything that the supply side has a responsibility. I cannot just say, well, you know, we did the minimum and yeah, well, whatever. If uh, end users don't do uh, what they have to do, don't patch their system, it's their fault. No, it's not. I mean, you know, we hear, but I mean, we all know people who are not, um, you know, good with computers and who, who don't even know what a patch is. Um, so even if users have a responsibility, um, the demand side has a greater responsibility. Now, when it comes to mainstream users, um, I mean, I feel a bit, I would say stupid about saying that, but it's about raising awareness and education. Um, we see uh, in our respective states how cybersecurity issues are, you know, getting to school, I would say, getting into school. Uh, I think we need to know to do uh, more. So when, you know, for example, um, our Chrome browsers tell us that we have to update, we just don't wait three or five days because, you know, we saw that and we just felt like, oh, no, I'm doing something else. You know, it takes like one minute to do so. So we need, it's about getting some new habits. And I think it's coming with times and, uh, education in raising awareness. Thank you so much. Um, I hope briefly we, we, ma we managed actually to characterize what we have done for the past six months with the, again, more than 30 organization. And I think it was quite challenging actually to keep everyone motivated and stay actually interesting in discussing the policy gaps in ST supply chain security and produce this the final report. But um, thank you so much to Andres, who have shared the links. I uh, will really encourage everyone to also get in touch if you have any uh, disagreements or interest in feedback. We will really think that the work on supply chain security would obviously continue uh, the next year, and there's a lot of to discuss all together. But now we move to the next part. Um, and I'm really happy now to introduce all of the other speakers. We uh, move into the roundtable discussion to answer probably quite uh, challenging and hopefully interesting question. Are we losing the fight against ICT supply chain threats or not? And we are really honored to have with us the four uh, speakers, again, representing diverse backgrounds in diverse regions. Uh, first of all, Jonas Kratz, Deputy Head of Policy Planning and Federal Department of Foreign Affairs in Switzerland. Katarina Magas, who is the program manager of cybersecurity for Internet uh, of Things at the US National Institute of Standards and Technology. May Ann Lim, executive director at Asia Cloud Computer Association. And Andreas Kuhn, who is senior fellow at Cyber Cooperation Initiative at Observer Research Foundation America. And Andreas Walsh also and May Ann have been among the most active contributors to the report. Um, I'm really happy to provide the floor to each of the speaker to share a little bit more about the background and what they do, and then we will be also move into the discussion um, right afterwards. Jonas, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Anastasia, and thanks uh, to all the Working Group SEX uh, uh, team for inviting me to this uh, important uh, zero day event um, and also happy to see that a few people have actually found the room in this beautiful beautifully lighted lightened up uh, IGF in, in Katowice it's really a uh, pity to see that that COVID-19 is, is again kind of uh, yeah uh, uh, not helping the physical attendance and and how much of effort has has gone into preparation of of this forum uh, once again I, I would i would have to say because i think last year it was planned in poland uh, as well um and thanks for giving me the floor um well um i am representing here the geneva dialogue which is an initiative that um the swiss federal department of foreign affairs is hosting together with diplo foundation and we have been happy also to participate in this working group um, since we gather about 20 industry representatives. Um, it's only, it's industry only. And, and we try to, in our dialogue, we, we try to do a similar thing focused really on the industry to see where there is a common ground uh, among, the, among the global players and Kaspersky is also one of them um, um, 
for enhancing supply chain um, security and, and uh, security by design. We also have the OECD uh, uh, as, a, as a frame of reference. So we have many commonalities and really happy to also discuss the report uh, today that, that you've, you've uh, laid out uh, for us uh, uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jonas. We'll definitely speak a little bit more about the Geneva Dialogue um, uh, today. And also I would like to provide the floor to Katarina to share a little bit more about the work that is especially being uh, currently done and um, under the progress within the US NIST. Great, thank you, Anastasia. Um, let me pull up some slides. Oh, okay. It's not working. Um, it says the host has disabled the screen sharing. So, um, shall I just go ahead and proceed then without slides and just give a little background? Oh, oh thank you, Arnold. Uh, fantastic. Um, so, I, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to address this group. Um, I do have to say, before I jump into my slides, um, the subject of fragmentation is something that has been coming up since um, since the very beginning of the program when we started it five years ago. Um, so I can appreciate the challenge, uh, and, and I do want to say I think we all recognize it, and it's definitely a goal we should all be working towards. Um, so very quickly, uh, for those of you that don't know, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on NIST. Uh, we are a non-regulatory agency in the U.S. Uh, we are the technical arm in the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, so our, our job is really to work very closely with our stakeholders, uh, primarily with, with private industry, um, but also international as well, um, and ensure that there is trust in uh, information technology. Um, and that we can advance this through things like standards um, and ensure the economic security and improve the quality of life of our of our citizens. Um, the one area that I do like to highlight that, that the role of NIST is, is slightly different is the work that we play within the U.S. federal government and in information security or in the cybersecurity space where there is legislation that has required U.S. federal agencies to follow NIST guidance when it comes to guidelines around uh, the security of uh, federal information systems. Uh, so often we have a slightly different role when it comes to cybersecurity because of the inherent role that we have with the US federal government agencies. Um, so uh, I do want to show the breadth of the work. Uh, there's no way I can talk about all the work we do at NIST here in support of IoT cybersecurity. My job as the cybersecurity program manager is not to talk about our, our, our one-off perhaps uh, projects, but represent the entire work across uh, NIST. And as you'll see, we have work that we're doing in uh, everything from smart cities to healthcare, uh, where we are looking at connected technologies in a healthcare setting. We're looking at connected technologies in a smart city setting. Uh, we do work in very early research areas. Uh, we're looking at things like lightweight crypto, which while we are not looking at lightweight crypto only for purposes of IoT cybersecurity, it obviously does contribute to things like IoT cybersecurity. Um, and then we also have other areas of work as well that are complementary, uh, such as the privacy framework that was recently uh, developed at NIST, working very closely in partnership with uh, our, our uh, stakeholders in U.S. industry. Next slide. So I won't talk about these too much because I actually think a lot of these subjects will come up during our conversation today. Um, but very early on in the program, we listen to stakeholders and we, before embarking on developing any sort of guidelines or guidance, uh, we wanted to understand what should be the guiding principles that should guide our work. And we came up with these five uh, principles, which we think still hold true today. Um, one is we believe all work needs to be based on an understanding of risk, 
Uh, this is due to the nature of IoT devices, but it's also due to the uh, contextual risk that's involved when you think about an IoT device. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the risk involved in the uh, IoT space is not just dependent on the device, but really on how that device is being used. Uh, second of all, we believe it's an ecosystem of things. Uh, while there is a lot of discussion around the importance of the devices, uh, the devices are often often part of a system and a system of systems and, and, and larger ecosystems. So um, addressing cybersecurity cannot be addressed through just the, the device. Third of all, uh, one size will not fit all. And um, fourth, we believe all work should be done at an outcome-based approach. That's due to the fact that this is a rapidly evaging, uh, emerging landscape. Uh, threats are uh, changing over time. Uh, we want to allow for a diversity of devices and approaches and allow stakeholders to choose the right approach for them. And of course, we need to engage with stakeholders. Next slide. So I realize that you are looking at uh, the broad topic of supply chain here. Um, I apologize. My focus is really on IoT devices, uh, but I do understand that IoT products and devices uh, often do play an integral part in securing the uh, ICT supply chain. Uh, so you'll forgive me if I have a very narrow focus, um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of sense of the policy landscape. Uh, that's been happening in the U.S., as well as give you an understanding of the work that we've been doing at NIST in support of these, these policy drivers. Um, so Executive Order 13800 uh, was signed by the President uh, back in 2017, and the intent of Executive Order 13800 was looking at the botnet threat. But one of the interesting things that came out in the report that uh, Department of Commerce and Department of Homeland Security worked together to deliver to the White House was identifying the critical role that IoT devices actually played in the, in the broader botnet threat. And one of the recommendations that went to the White House uh, was to develop a baseline and ensure that there is a marketplace of more secure devices. Um, in response to this, uh, NIST took on the role of developing and recommending what we call a core baseline, uh, which is a core set of recommendations for IoT devices. Um, it is not a single core baseline that is intended to fit all devices. We recognize that consumer devices are going to have a different need than industrial. Uh, we even recognize that the US federal government may have a different risk profile and have a different need, but a core baseline was intended to represent a good starting point for all IoT devices, regardless of market. So um, this was released in uh, 2019. Uh, this was released in the draft of NIST IR 8259, 8259A, and 8259B. Um, those have, have, we've seen quite a bit of, uh, I have to say, alignment internationally. It's, it's very interesting when we look at our work, while uh, perhaps there isn't absolute harmonization, I think there's a lot of basis for interoperability because uh, it's, you can tell when you look at 8259, 8259A and B, um, there is quite a bit of commonality uh, that we see with some of our other um, peers across the world that we, we work with over time. Um, another interesting policy driver was the uh, Cyberspace Solarium Commission report uh, that was released. Uh, this was an independent commission that was um, stood up and, and directed by US uh, Congress. And the Cyberspace Solarium, Solarium Commission, um, looking at the broad space of uh, cyberspace and how can we ensure the security of cyberspace, uh, identified some actions around IoT devices as well. And I won't go into too much detail there, but there are recommendations there that have been made to US Congress that have made their way into legislation. Um, Another thing that you, uh, I think is an interesting kind of policy driver in the US side was the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020. Uh, that is the law that was passed uh, right at the end of uh, 2020. And the uh, intent of the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020 was really to uh, leverage the US federal government and leverage the purchasing power of the US federal government and establish a minimum for IoT devices that US federal government agencies procure 
and thereby kind of lifting all boats by hopefully uh, driving uh, demand for better IoT devices, uh, but also to kind of set the example and lead by example. Um, we just recently, actually last week, we completed our tasking under the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act, and we published what is the mandatory guidelines for federal agencies. Uh, it's special publication uh, 800-213 and 800-213-A. Uh, both of these publications are mandatory for federal agencies. Uh, the federal acquisition regulations will be updated to ensure that federal agencies can only procure devices that meet the minimum guidelines in 800-213. Um, and then perhaps the last thing that I'd like to mention, which might be interest to the, interesting to this group, uh, is the more recent executive order 14028. Uh, which directed NIST, amongst many, many things, and uh, you're probably familiar with the other parts of the executive order, which are very focused on supply chain, uh, but the piece that I'm most focused on and, and most familiar with are the pieces that are looking at a cybersecurity label for consumer IoT products. And we've released a number of white papers. We actually released a white paper uh, just late last week, and we will be hosting a workshop uh, but the intent is in February, we will be putting out a recommendation uh, for a path forward towards a cybersecurity label for consumer IoT devices. Um, and that's it. And thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Katarina. I think I now got actually what could be the key to harmonization globally if you manage as a government to harmonize all of those different pieces of legislation, at least domestically, and because it's right now looks so much, it's complex. Being coming from the industry, I didn't know about many of those pieces of legislation that you actually mentioned, so super interesting. Thank you. I'd like to also pass the floor to me and also sharing a little bit more about the background uh, of the Asia Cloud Computer Association. And specifically from me and we will be expecting hearing lots of about the Asia Pacific approach to the ICT supply chain security. Thank you, Anastasia, and welcome everybody to IGF. It's a little bit late tonight uh, for me in Asia. It's about past midnight where I am. So if you're dialing in from the Asia time zone or even in Australia, hi, hey, and uh, I feel your pain. <laughs> for us in Asia Pacific, I think that what's been, what's been happening with the cybersecurity and the supply chain, I think I completely agree with everything that's been said before. We're observing a lot of the same trends, a lot of the same complaints, a lot of the same issues the same issues of fragmentation have always been coming up over and over and over again and uh like it or not i'm not, i'm probably going to say something which is not going to be very popular with the asia side of things but we tend to be price takers when it comes to a lot of the discussions on cybersecurity, not because of anything but it's really because sometimes uh the 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 products and, and other services are actually being developed elsewhere. And we tend to be following along the, the, the trends um, of fragmentation and being buffeted about by the issues. However, some of the other issues which aren't, uh, where we aren't really price takers, or I'm really proud to say, I'm, I'm, I'm in Singapore, I'm based in Singapore, I am, Sing I am Singaporean. Uh, a lot of the work that's been done leading some of the discussions right now have been led by the Singapore government in talking about, for example, trust mechanisms such as cybersecurity labeling scheme. And I think that everybody has heard of the CLS, so I won't be going too much into it because it's always being held up as an industry standard. We're very proud of it. It actually works. Uh, and as somebody who has lived through the days of the modem, having a little sticker on them, uh, let me tell you that it, it, it works on a consumer level, sort of, because it's very visceral. You see a sticker there and there are lots of these things which are happening. So, however, this, this does not... Uh, this does not absolve us, or this does not exempt us, sorry, the word is exempt. This does not exempt us from the second problem where you're seeing a lot of the, the problems of con the consumer end being that weakest link in the security of everything. The, this consumer is, is the, um, I always use my mother as an example of this. My mother, her idea of cybersecurity is, oh, mommy, you can't put the password to your email on a post-it and stick it on your on your desktop computer you have to have a better security she says okay 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 sure no problem no problem and then the next time i go home and visit her she's like man man 
I've got better cybersecurity now. I said, okay, tell me. So I go to a table and okay, it's clean. You know, yeah, there are no more post-it notes. I was like, okay, so let me tell you where my password is. It's underneath the keyboard now. <laughs> I'm like, okay, mommy, that's not exactly the way to be increasing your cybersecurity. But, you know, we, we, have, we have those issues. So fragmentation, uh, consumer side of things, uh, uh, bring price takers or not are some of the trends that we're seeing. A lot of the other trends that we're seeing are, uh, are actually quite positive trends. I think that there are a lot more collaborations and data sharing that are happening between certs that are more, ASEAN as a regional organization, we have always had these drills, the asset drills that are between the certs where you're basically having a, a massive uh, a cyber drill together. And this is a got, this has definitely got uh, to do a lot with uh, trying to increase the cybersecurity awareness of the certs within the region. I think that, that the, a lot of that has been working. Uh, I, I do think that there is a lot of hope that there are um, that there is going to be more uh, inclusion in the cybersecurity sort of supply chain, cybersecurity supply chain discussions and cybersecurity discussions writ large, because I do know a lot of the big companies are starting to get uh, move their cybersecurity monitoring features, for example, Cisco, uh, um, I know Kaspersky as well, as well as uh, Microsoft. I know that there are different zones which are now following the sun. You're actually having a lot of the cybersecurity uh, uh, training as well as monitoring being put within Asia and all the way to, to uh, the Western countries as well. So that's all really, really good. And that's some, that's some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, I do think that later on in the discussion, we're going to be able to chat, have a little bit of a chat uh, about you know, what's, what's going to happen in the future. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause there, but that's what we're seeing from the Asia Pacific side of things. If you're seeing something different or if you have something to ask me of the Asia Pacific, please feel free to ask, uh, drop it in the chat or just, you know, uh, I think that drop it in the chat is the only way to do that. So please do drop it in the chat and we'll have a little bit of a chat about it. Back to you, Anastasia. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and the... Not uh, actually the last, but um, really also an interesting perspective that we're going to hear, Andres Kuhn. Um, Andres coming from the civil society slash policy uh, background. And I know many of really interesting ways that um, Andres did in the past, but it would be really great to hear from you, Andres, directly um, a little bit more about your background interest in us to supply chain security. Sure, happy to. Thank you, Nastya, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, again, my name is Andreas Kuhn. I'm a senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation America, and I've, I've spent a broad portfolio somewhere, supply chain security to 5G, IoT, cyber norms, um, cyber independence, systemic risk, and I think that all comes really nicely together in the field of, of supply chain, and so I think that's, that's why I'm here. And I, uh, it's also, I think, another reason why this is actually not the first time, but actually the third time where we are organizing a workshop at the IGF to uh, talk about supply chain security. Um, over the years, uh, those aspects have changed a little bit um, with different audiences, with different emphasis. But um, I'm very pleased that this important topic continues to uh, uh, resonate with the IGF community, not, not only because I think it has become more prevalent during COVID-19 and now everyone is talking about supply chain. Um, but I think it also recall in our earlier conversation that, um, th that we, we, maybe may have found it, we might, might have found it kind of challenging to think about how supply chain security kind of connects to a more narrow definition of internet governance. But I, again, I'm glad we're here and having this conversation. Um, at the same time, I'll, I'll keep my, my introductionary remarks shorter, but I want to obviously thank you for everyone uh, online as well as offline for, for coming here and, and being part of this conversation uh, to all uh, speakers as well as all my co-organizers, but especially Ambassador Verdi and uh, um, Arnold Gustier uh, for making, um, uh, for graciously, graciously agreeing and, and making opening remarks here. Um, Again, I think I, I, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop here and very much looking forward to uh, coming to the substantive, uh, uh, to the more substantive part of the conversation today. Thank you, Nastia. Thank you so much. So we have today for the discussion to discuss if we're losing the fight against life to supply chain threats or not. The three key blocks of the questions that we'd like to discuss with all of the four speakers, and those blocks include the digging a little bit deeper how the policies and approaches are being developed 
how actually they're being implemented and what key ingredients that could make them work and the way forward, a little bit reflecting about the future scenarios for already next year, closing the 2021 chapter. So I'd like to uh, pass the mic first to Jonas, also keeping a focus on the uh, Geneva um, dialect, really the unique example of how the government, um, civil society, and here I refer to um, Diplo Foundation and the loss of the industry partners, being able for the second year actually discussing lots of the really good food for food on ensuring the security of digital products. So Jonas, the question is, in developing policies and approaches to secure digital products, including IoT and uh, smart devices, what are the, the key important factors to consider um, and make them really effective those policies in the future? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Nastya, and thanks to all, all the other speakers also for the perspectives, really interesting. And also uh, thanks to, to Katerina, especially from, from NIST for giving us their her, um, timeline, which is really intriguing to, to see, um, because we have been in the Geneva Dialogue, we have been approaching it from, from the industry side, and we often ask ourselves, Okay, what is what is really out there um, in terms of regulation uh, uh, that 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 would guide us? And it seems uh, in the U.S. You, you really have some parts, at least in the IoT uh, field, you you really have some parts uh, already in 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 place. And and it's good to hear also that others uh, are following um, uh, this advice, uh, so that we don't uh, don't don't see a really fragmented landscape uh, worldwide. So. Um, when developing policies, well, uh, from we have been approaching it in the Geneva Dialogue on Responsible Behavior in Cyberspace from the from the producer side for the last uh, two years. So we had, uh, I think it's uh, 35 meetings, uh, all virtual due to the pandemic, uh, uh, where, where we were discussing um, um, how producers really can can make an impact um, on the um, Enhanced security of of the of the supply chain and and one of the crucial one of the crucial aspects that we have identified and which is also in in, in the um, Paris Call report was was the security by design and then also other aspects like vulnerability disclosure and uh, um, now lastly we have been discussing a lot also key concepts such as um, um, the software bill of materials to increase transparency to really know what is what is what is in a product. And which has also, I think, been uh, been developed by NIST and NTIA in the in the US. Uh, the, these concepts. So I think um, um, when you look at developing policies, one of the key factors for effectiveness is, of course, that that you need to get the the main actors on on board, and and this is always always a challenge. Um, um, also in the software. Field, you have the open source community, which we still get, didn't get a clue how to, how to, for example, improve the practices in the open source community. If you think about software bill of materials, how do you want to um, implement this concept with the open source community? So that's still an, uh, still an open question. And um, we've also been looking in the Geneva Dialogue, as I said in the beginning, a bit at the regulatory field. And uh, recently we have uh, been commissioning a study by the um, Swiss Federal Institute for Technology in, in Zurich. And they have been looking also at regulatory approaches uh, worldwide for, for digital security of products. And here, um, when it comes to the government side, so not the producer side, but the government side, um, they have been, we have identified three different, um, I think, challenges that when developing policies. So the first challenge um, that has been identified is um, the cost of compliance, which which is why many governments also are considering measures such as um, voluntary uh, certification um, labeling schemes, which are entirely voluntary, or also baseline requirements, which are not put into law, but uh, more like a, um, yeah, like a help for producers to, to orient themselves um, towards them. So, so one of the key issues is, is the cost of compliance, which is, if you want, slowing down um, 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 a broad uh, uh, development of, of policies for, for more cybersecurity, because we, you don't want to destroy the, the, the existing ecosystem of, of product development, which is making us more efficient. 
uh, in a way, but it also has costs in terms of security. The second factor, um, second factor is also um, how to keep track with the with the current development. And, and in Geneva Dialogue, we had a we had an event which uh, with uh, standardization organizations, which also play a crucial role in uh, making the environment more secure. Because ideally, everyone would all the regulators and all the companies would all use international standards when um, developing their approaches. But what we heard from standardization organizations was also on an international level that that they have difficulty in keeping track with the current technological developments. So you need really agile, agile and adaptable risk-based standards as, as uh, uh, Katarina has also um, uh, told us uh, recently that you cannot have one size fits all, but you need really a risk-based approach, and the, the approach also needs to evolve with the um, with the threat landscape and needs to be uh, based on an accurate threat modeling. So I think those are all challenges uh, that we have identified also in the framework of the Geneva Dialogue that make it so difficult to develop the right policies at the right time and also at the global level, because what we want to avoid in the end is is um, um, to have a fragmentation of different regulatory regimes, which would, um, as was, was also pointed out, uh, one of the challenges is also, um, I think, um, Ord in the beginning said that one of the challenges is uh, um, transparency about the requirements and often producers don't really know uh, what requirements are in place in one marketplace or how they will be applied in the end. Uh, how the conformity assessment will be made uh, if there's a mandatory standard in place or mandatory regulation. So I think this is also a uh, key um, to keep in mind in the end that 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 we need a level playing field uh, globally. And, and here I think there's much more to be done. Thank you. Super, thank you so much, Jonas, for such a really structured overview of the key factors. Um, Katarina, why do you think, in your perspective, what are the key principles in designing those emerging um, government and industry approaches to ensure the security of digital products? Um, so, of course, I agree with everything Jonas said as well. Uh, again, every time we attend, I attend these events, I always feel very vindicated because I hear echoes of things that I've been thinking and things that we've discovered over time. Um, I think one thing I would characterize uh, is, is very early on, especially once we started working and, and focusing kind of on the supplier and the producer of, of IoT devices, uh, is there was this inherent tension between the market that wants predictability and wants to have, uh, a, you know, for lack of a better term, a checklist and have a, a predictable outcome and say, if I do the following things, then I know um, that I you know, won't get in trouble. And, and if something does happen, I, I won't be held liable. At the same time, uh, because of everything I talked about earlier and uh, the complexity behind IoT devices and how each IoT device has different capabilities. Um, you know, if, if some that have actuators, uh, they can affect the physical world. If that actuator is actually um, integrated with perhaps some sort of algorithm on the back end that allows for automated uh, action to be taken, then you have the ability for um, a much higher risk sort of transaction to occur where you have the sensor connecting to an algorithm, connecting to a, an actuator. Um, so we struggled quite a bit with understanding how can, how can we balance this natural tension uh, between the market wanting predictability and again, understanding that everything needs to be done in a risk-based approach. So um, we, we combined that in what we, uh, we came up with our core baseline, which is our recommendations. But that is embedded within a recommendation that you follow a process and that you do evaluate risks and threats, uh, and you do do some things like threat modeling, you do some things like understand uh, who is your, what is the anticipated maturity of your user? Uh, what can you really expect of the consumer or the user or the customer to actually do with this? Um, because again, we don't think security can be a checklist. Um, I would think the, the second trend that I think we've really uh, embraced, and, and again, I go back to those principles, uh, is that 
we think everything needs to be outcome based. And especially when you are talking about trying to establish guidelines that are intended to have broad applicability. Um, we really try to steer away from getting very prescriptive and trying to tell manufacturers, organizations exactly what to do. We think it's much better to say, this is the outcome that we recommend you achieve and allow the marketplace, allow the manufacturers to work within SDOs and work uh, with each other and develop standards to actually achieve those outcomes because we think that standards can actually evolve much faster. And so it's more likely that you will be able to meet the emerging threats. Uh, it's more likely as well that you will have a marketplace of standards. We don't think there's going to be one standard to rule them all. Uh, we think it's good to have multiple standards so that there's many ways that a manufacturer can pick and say, this is how I'm going to achieve the outcome. Or it can even be the customer who looks at the standard and says, for my environment, I need this sort of standard to, to fit with the rest of my system. Um, the other thing is, you know, transparency. I, I completely agree that transparency is something that's very important. I think one thing we are really, uh, you know, considering as we move forward, uh, the way we worked in our program is we started out looking at the enterprise use case because we said, right, our role is to ensure that the U.S. federal government has guidelines around security. So we, we approached it from a sense of saying an enterprise customer has tools, certain levels of maturity, can control many things within their environment, and therefore the customer, um, in this case the U.S. federal government or any sort of enterprise, can, can look at what is this device providing, right? What is this supplier giving me in terms of cybersecurity capabilities, in terms of documentation? What can they tell me about their vulnerability processes? And each organization can, can make both a risk-based decision and can also look at their tools and say, based on the tools that I have, um, I can or cannot make use of these capabilities that are offered in the IoT device. I think as you move down the spectrum towards the consumer, uh, you know, one of the things we're looking at and we've invited feedback on from our stakeholders is, and, and something we keep hearing actually quite loudly, from the consumer who's the customer at home, you cannot have that same expectation of what sort of maturity they have. So transparency may, may mean something very different for the home consumer versus the, the enterprise consumer. Um, I can probably go on as well. You know, um, we have what we uh, developed very early on at NIST called the CPS framework, uh, which is lo was looking at the cyber physical system perspective. And very early on, the cyber uh, physical system uh, framework talked about the inherent trade-offs. Uh, sometimes they're trade-offs, sometimes they complementary support each other, but there's cybersecurity, which we're talking about here, but there's an inherent relationship with safety. Sometimes cybersecurity supports safety. Uh, sometimes cybersecurity can get in the way of safety. And depending on how you implement cybersecurity, it can impact and cause physical harm. Uh, same thing with privacy. There is an inherent tension sometimes between cybersecurity and privacy. Cybersecurity supports privacy, um, but sometimes you will say to achieve the optimal outcome, uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, we may do something uh, that depending on uh, the situation and how it's being used could have uh, what some people call privacy negative outcomes. Um, and there's other areas, resilience, reliability. And I'm sure if you build IoT devices um, or if you use them in an, in an enterprise scenario, you also say, well, I, I own a factory and, and, and the most important thing to me is uh, that those devices are, let's say those devices are reliable because I need to keep my factory up and running. Um, whereas if perhaps if you're a hospital, your number one you know, priority may be safety. And you may say between those five things, uh, safety is the most important for me. And I'd be happier uh, to, to perhaps sacrifice something somewhere else, maybe privacy, uh, but I, I need to ensure that I keep people safe. So I'm not saying that's the case, but I'm just trying to illustrate the different examples. So uh, 
I think we have a complicated, I'm, I'm, I'm infamous for saying on my LinkedIn post, it's complicated when people ask me an answer. Um, I wish there was a silver bullet, uh, but then I'd be out of a job, of course. You know, I, I'd be doing something else now, but it, it, it is complicated. And often I think the policy needs to uh, strike a balance between allowing that flexibility because it is complicated while trying to be prescriptive. Uh, so that you can have kind of a, a predictable outcome. So, thank you. Thank you so much for actually masterfully covering different aspects. Um, I really like that you started with highlighting the complexity of IoT devices and also the same complexity in actually the fact that the different categories of end users um, use that I, IoT devices, be it end users or enterprises, their approaches to ensure the security would be also slightly different. And it's good that we um, probably getting more and more clear about this different approaches for this bomb as an initiative definitely might work for the enterprises, but would actually have little um, efficiency communicating this just end users um, like myself with the IoT products. So definitely that there should be different and more creative approaches to tackle this information asymmetry about the security of products. Um, May Ann, I'm coming to you, um, to you right now, um, covering the perspective of the Asia Pacific again, because we also know that the Asia Pacific being traditionally the region for manufacturing lots of the IoT devices. So it's really also important to make sure that we are here somehow aligned um, and in understanding how to secure pro uh, products. I like what Katharina has said, you know, the idea of you know, it's complicated. I think that it's very, very complicated. And indeed, I feel that there needs to be a little bit, uh, there needs to be more learning of how to balance. So Kat Katharina mentioned that, you know, there the, it is a balance, but the question is always, how do you balance? Because a lot of the discussions that I've been having about supply chain security, about cybersecurity have really been about what's your risk profile? Because the, 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 the question always fits back to the person asking it. You say, oh, I need to have the most secure A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'm like, okay, that's fine. You need to have the most secure whatever it is, but what's your risk profile? And also what's your budget? Because there are different ways to secure things. You can want to have the most secure whatever it is, but if you don't have the budget for it, then it's kind of a moot point to be talking about it. So that idea of that risk profile, balancing all of the different factors, I think we need to have a little bit more of a discussion of how do you actually start to balance out these things. And I think this is where the report actually starts to, to put a framework to that discussion, um, the, the report that we've just, just launched. Uh, so if you have a little bit of a... a look at it you know if you if you're tired of reading through the whole entire thing just scroll through and look for the pictures and look for the diagrams you've got lots of nice diagrams there that will show you the little balances there uh thank you very much to those people who are working on that so i feel in asia that's what i'm seeing i don't think it's an asian discussion by the way i think that it's an everybody discussion how do you balance it because it's not a zero-sum game it's not a zero-sum game it's not saying that you're either going to have total security or you're not going to have security it's going to be a balance that you need to make so that's one thing which i want to point out that that's one thing which i'm seeing and some, some of the conversations which i'm having the other conversation which i think needs to be put in place and i haven't heard it being raised so far is the idea of trust trust mechanisms we had a little bit of discussion about it because we we, we are talking about uh cyber security labeling schemes we are talking about certification but we i think that we need to have a little bit more discussion of how do you how do you develop for example trusted trading partners in a systematic manner i think we're trying to make sure that the supply chain is safe we're trying to make sure that there are trusted products trusted whatever it is but the thing is that the the balance here between the geopolitics versus economics and businesses the companies private companies need to private companies and governments need to understand and manage this perception and the reality so the idea of the transparency and the trusted mechanisms i think we'll need to be we will need to be starting to discuss what is that mix of independence and interdependence that needs to come alongside everything because again it's not a zero sum game again we have to balance everything and this is not just for for uh, consumers or businesses which are trying to make decisions um, on, on equipment, but it's also 
a whole of the ecosystem approach? How are you going to create a trusted ecosystem where you'll be able to check and balance some of the risks that you're, you're going to be seeing here? I don't have all the answers. And again, this is not a very uniquely, uh, a, a, it's not a unique to Asia issue, it, but there are a lot of questions here. And there are a lot more questions than there are answers. I do think that there are, again, coming back to Catherine, sorry, Catherine, I know I, I just, I've just texted her just privately. I've just said I'm a big, big fan uh, of, a big nerd fan of this. I think that the idea of the multitude, that fragmentation and many, many available uh, certifications is going to be the way to go. The other thing which I think needs to be done uh, to, that, that I see at least from the Asian side of things, I feel that governments need to make certification more accessible to uh, people who are a little bit more at risk. And I'm not talking about consumers because that's one very unique group of people. I mean, my mother notwithstanding, but my mother being one of the examples of that. Small and medium enterprises may often want to have, or may, may actually be uh, available and, and uh, they have the ability to have a lot of innovation coming up from them, but they may not be able to access uh, the the cybersecurity and security technical specifications we may not want to because sometimes they're just really expensive and if you're a small and medium enterprise you may not want to do that now we don't want to overturn for example how ISO and other uh, the uh, triple E how how the how the technical specifications are purchased so you have got to leave it aside but I think that governments within at least my region, I and again, happy to be chatting with you about your other regions as well. But I feel that a lot of uh, governments within Asia may want to try and make those uh, standards a little bit more accessible. One example is within Singapore, I do know that we actually put, we buy uh, the, or we we're given complimentary copies uh, of the standard document. And it's a physical copy and it's thrown into the library. Uh, and Singapore is quite small, so the visit to the library isn't exactly very far away, but that, make, that makes that certification actually very, very accessible to small and medium enterprises. Is that a way for that to be systematically available for small and medium enterprises? That's one way. So that idea of building that transparency, building that, building that accessibility, I think those are the two things which I contribute to the discussion at this point in time. Thank you, so, thank you so much. And again, uh, focus on the complexity of IT devices is one of the also challenges in IT. And I think also we touch here the second question, the challenge to the small and medium enterprises as well, both as their suppliers and as well as the consumers. But um, I also like to provide the floor to Andres, also who is among the authors of the really interesting reports in the past on the tech nationalism, maybe also to share a little bit of perspective from that. Uh, and the further and the earlier uh, works. So the address, what do you think would be the key principle in designing those industry and uh, regulatory approaches? Um, that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, let, let me, um, um, I obviously don't want to repeat all some of, uh, some of the really good remarks my colleagues already made earlier. And I, I, I have to say I agree uh, with most of them. I think I will push back a little bit on the fragmentation and the cost of compliance arguments. Maybe we can come, um, uh, up with that and discuss that a little bit later. But then um, um, I think in terms of one principle that has not been mentioned yet that I think is worthwhile pointing out is like the life cycle security as a principle, which, which also uh, I think is in the Paris call principle six that's, that's in there. It addresses the need to strengthen the security of digital processes, products and services throughout their life cycles and supply chain as it's written there. And, and often in our conversations, uh, we are kind of focusing on securing the supply chain without asking questions about um, how life cycle related uh, security concerns are addressed. In particular, I'm thinking of the patching of security flaws of no longer um, vendor supported legacy ICT systems. So I think that's something something important. Um, but you know, I, I think we we've heard a lot about today, kind of like the current state of supply chain security and some of those challenges. And I wanted to briefly, uh, you know, go just a few years back to kind of like illustrate how far we've come so far. Um, you know, I remember back in 2016, I was with the East West Institute and we released this report. I'll hold it up here. I can share uh, the link afterwards. It's called the East West Institute's um, ICT Buyer's Guide, in, in which we kind of like started talking about third party vendor risk, um, or as we call them today, mostly a supply chain risk, um, highlighting kind of like the risk that come from, an, uh, from outside your organizations when you buy like stuff, you know, software, hardware, uh, services, and so forth. 
um, and that uh, you know buyers have to deal with those um, with those risks. Um, and this was just like five years ago, um, and so it kind of like seems like a long time in in, in cyber in cyber time. Uh, but I think back then people haven't really thought too much about that, so it was kind of new and. You know, I, I want to share one example here. It's like I remember kind of very distinctly a, a conversation I had with a representative from a large uh, ICT compa compa company a year later uh, as we were preparing um, um, comments to the updated NIST cybersecurity framework. And I think there was like this, this things that we tried to deal with is should supply chain security or supply chain risk be kind of um, a, a separate explicit category or should it be kind of like hidden somewhere else under another kind of risk category. Um, and I remember, and it still blows my mind today, kind of like that representative and, and the, uh, that person's team made the argument that, that it's not necessary to, to kind of highlight supply chain risk as a separate, um, a separate risk. So it doesn't really deserve to be treated separately as its own category. And I think by that, again, this was just a few years ago, right? Uh, we can see how much has changed, how many efforts have kind of spun up um, across the industry to address that issue. And I think that was my first point where I said, oh, maybe I want to push back a little bit. So I think I do understand that fragmentation can be a challenge, but I think it's actually a good thing, right? Because a lot of different places in different sectors uh, take now supply chain security seriously and have come up with their own approaches. You know, I, of course, some harmonization will be very helpful. Uh, but I think it, it speaks to the fact um, that um, a lot of progress has been made. Let me very briefly kind of like talk about um, some of the US-based work on, on supply chain security. Um, I mean, there's been quite a bit of work done, right? And, and so it's, it's actually quite impressive. So I think last time I've counted, there have been like nine executive orders that are directly addressing supply chain security in some form or, or another. There has been a seminal a supply chain review at the White House addressing mostly emerging and critical technologies, probably also kind of caused by some of the concerns elevated during the COVID-19 pandemic. There's been the National Security Commission on AI, the Salarium Commission that Kat mentioned earlier, that dedicated some of their efforts to, to look into supply chain uh, issues as well as foreign dependencies. Um, there are uh, numerous efforts um, and task force that, that deal, you know, at DHS, at CISA, at NIST, kind of like to address supply chain security. And I think what you have not mentioned yet is like, and what, well, I guess um, Arno Costier kind of like pointed towards that in his remark earlier, right? That, that you know, there's a huge defense sector that has um, an extensive history to think about supply chain risk, uh, you know, components that come like, uh, that they might be affected by uh, foreign adversaries. And obviously, you know, last but not least, kind of rising geopolitical tensions, uh, the, the kind of still ongoing 5G controversies come to mind. And I think uh, we could think of them as a as kind of a really large scale uh, case study in supply chain security. Um, of course, this is only a US view. And I think that's much more uh, that could be said around other countries. And I think that's why I really appreciated that um, uh, Mayan kind of like provided like a nation perspective on this as well. Um, I think where we are here right now, we started defining the problem, and now what really needs to be done, I think that's kind of the second part, or, you know, or some of the follow-up questions on this, on this panel is kind of like, what are the action and organizational institutional changes that are needed to actually uh, put those, all the good work that we've done so far into practice to effectively address supply chain security risk? Thank you so much, Andres. Um, I'd like to really probably right now uh, raise the questions that we have in the chat. And the first question from Susan, and maybe to address this to, to Jonas and Katarina, first of all, as the government uh, representatives, um, and also those who are really in the field of the policy planning and um, participating in the development of those policies. Is there a centralized database of standards policies? I assume Susan asked if it's possible uh, theoretically, that could review product, uh, future product for compliance with international agreements, policy standards. If not, can this be a priority theoretically? So, Jonas, Karina, would you like to share your remarks very briefly? Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, very good question. Um, well, I mean, Mayan also highlighted the, the, the challenges with regard to international standards in the first place. I mean, they are not public and you have to get them through your national standards association and so on. And I think here, as Mayans also said, we, we need to we need to um, 
change a bit the way this is working and and at least make make versions of these standards available that um um to to the public uh in a in a, in a different way um and we have been at this discussion that we had in may with standardization organizations we had we have discussed a bit uh, the the approaches that they have to towards developing international standards and and they have also said yeah we need to we need to change a bit the way we are working and and then they are also in the process of adapting um of adapting their um um work so uh, i think here there needs there needs to be some some change to make standards uh, publicly available and when it comes to regulations uh, this is even more um difficult um uh, the study that has been done within the framework of Geneva Dialogue, um, it also encountered some difficulties when trying to um, uh, do a broad overview of, of the regulations that are in place in different world regions. So this is also something which, um, yeah, which is a uh, um, open question on at, at the moment i think so so we don't have this overview uh, it's a rapidly evolving field and uh, more needs to be done and uh, it should be a priority i think thank you katarina is there yeah so i was sorry sorry apologies if very briefly we have somewhere for minutes till the end of the session Okay, sure. Um, so it was very interesting because I was I was watching the chat. I'm sorry. Um, I used to. So I saw that uh, Andreas made the uh, comment about what standards are we talking about? Uh, because I think um, often the word standard, I think, you know, in being from NIST, where the, the word standard is in the title, um, I try to talk about, you know, uppercase standards, where we're talking about actual standards that have been developed through, uh, you know, SDOs, but there, there's a host of other tools that are actually available out there, and, and, and standards are not the only tool. Um, and, and I know perhaps this isn't quite exactly on uh, in, in response to your question, but the reason I want to mention it is because the word ecosystem came up so many times and the word trust came up and how can we enable trust in, from an ecosystem approach. And I recently had someone who talked about the ecosystem and said there's actually three layers and three views of the ecosystem. There's the tools that we have, the how uh, that are across the ecosystem and all of them have a role to play and they all have to work together in order to enable trust. And they were talking about things like standards, which is one piece of it, but it's not just standards, it's tools, it's best practices, it's the regulations, it's all the how these pieces fit together. The other one is the who. There's no like, again, one person in the ecosystem, I think that can actually take on the role of enabling trust. It's gonna require the entire ecosystem is going to re require the retailers who are actually putting the products on the shelf. It's the users of the devices, whether they are the consumers or whether they're the manufacturers, it's government. Everyone is going to have a role in the ecosystem. And then the last part is the where in the ecosystem. Because again, I think it's not just about the device. You know, there's a technology we've, we've been looking at or a protocol it's called MUD, the manufacturer's usage description. Um, and it really is all about how can we actually leverage network devices to implement security and complement the type of security that an IoT device can, can provide. So there's, there's lots of other places in the ecosystem that we can look at. So um, this probably doesn't answer your question directly um, because again, I think standards is just one piece. Standards alone, we can't just rely on standards. Um, but also I'm not a policy maker and I better not at all uh, make any sort of comments about policy. But um, Thank you. thanks very Thank you. much. Yeah. Um, I also really like the, the dynamics and the discussions taking place in the chat. I think they also provide a parallel insights to what we've been discussing with. Um, going to the close of the session, as we also covered, most of you really covered the challenges. We spoke about the SMBs and many other actors, the complexity of IT devices and so on. Um, but maybe right now, the probably the final question, what do you think would should be at least the key or the first priority ingredient tackling the ice to supply chain security, be it from the economic perspective or anyone else? I'd like to start with Andres, then May Ann, then Katarina and Jonas, if very briefly. I think that 
the technical standard is definitely one part, but as Katrina said, well, let's put that aside. Again, I think that there, there needs to be an, another discussion around trust mechanisms. I think that the, the trust mechanisms are really, really lacking. How do you know when you can trust something or someone that is, is not, is, is not uh, uh, quite there? Because I think that that's, that trust deficit is definitely something which is a big challenge. I think the fragmentation is something that we all need to address. I think we do need to have a little bit more uh, widespread discussion. And this is kind of important. It, it, we are, I think that we're all talking to people who are within the zone. We all know that it's really important, but I think we need to have a little bit more widespread discussion on the actual ICT supply chains. There are better imaging and virtualization tools. I think that there needs to be a little bit more people talking about it and mapping it out and bringing it more to the fore that in, in the chat, I mean, thanks Vladimir for, for bringing up a lot of that really, really interesting discussion. I said that I think that cybersecurity has now uh, become a bit of a tragedy of the commons. Who's going to be in charge of this, pre keeping, keeping track and keeping the whole entire ecosystem safe? I think that everybody's now looking to each other and saying that, okay, well, we're gonna be, we're gonna take care of our own little garden, but not everything is, is put in its right position. So I think we have a more widespread discussion so that we can actually start defragmenting and putting some of the pieces together. I'll stop there um, and uh, give other people the time. Over to you, Catherine. Andreas? Uh, thank you. I'll, I, I'll let me make this short. I think trust is an important issue. I, I, I put a, a link um, uh, into the chat about a discussion about trust centers. And so I think that's one approach to address this. I think that the deeper point that I want to try to make this, so we need institutional changes. So we need new organizations or new mechanisms to kind of like deal with this thing. And I think we haven't really figured out what that is. I think standards are good, uh, documents are good, but we need something that what I'm referring to organizational, institutional changes and mechanisms to actually enable that. Another part we haven't talked about and I think would be important is uh, uh, the question around uh, cyber insurance as a way to address supply chain security. And the third one was mentioned very early, what can international institutions on the UN level, uh, the program of action was mentioned by uh, Ambassador Vefia very early on as a, as a way to uh, uh, kind of bring this discussion on, on an international UN level to, to uh, address that there as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katerina. Um, just uh, very quickly, because I know we are running out of time, um, you know, while the word fragmentation, harmonization, I hear often or not, you know, over and over again, if I had a word cloud, those would be probably very big words in the cloud. Um, I think one of the challenges when we start talking about globally trying to address, uh, you know, fragmentation, or, or at least trying to say we're going to harmonize, I think it's very difficult because I think, um, the policy tools, some of the assumptions that we make are so different. Um, you know, some in some places they have a much more top down, they have much more of a preventative approach perhaps to cybersecurity. Um, in some countries, there is far more of a um, reactive perhaps approach, so, uh, you know, kind of allow people to, to, to do something and only after if something goes bad, do you actually then try to kind of go back and reinforce. And so I think with this wide variety of tools or appetite for risk and appetite for regulating, um, to say we're going to have harmonization, I think is difficult. I think what we should be talking about is interoperability and how can we ensure mutual recognition and interoperability for different approaches? Um, and underlying interoperability is trust. What's the trust framework? So that when you do something different than I do, I can trust that the outcomes of your approach is the same as my approach, even though they're, they're different. Over to you. I talked longer than I intended to. Thank, Thank you. you. And finally, Jonas, and then we'll wrap up. Yes, I hope you, that I can still talk because the IGF is telling us we have to end. Anyways, um, just a few uh, thoughts. I mean, the UN was already mentioned. Those discussions at the UN level are going to intensify. And I think we need to provide the link between those um, because they also mentioned supply chain, but they don't know exactly how to implement it. And, and in Geneva Dialogue, I think what is what we will do is, is to provide the link with those discussions and to, sh and to also um, find a common approach and Mayen correctly said that it's 
good to talk to a variety. We need to broaden the we, we need to broaden our own horizon and talk to a variety of of uh, of actors. So so we need to find a common ground uh, there in in between the industry how they want to um, proceed also to to enhance trust globally and and to uh, secure the supply chain globally. And I think that's what we are going to do next year. And yeah, uh, see you on uh, Thursday for our workshop. And thanks so much um, uh, for this great discussion from thank, our side. Thank you so much to everyone for sharing the insights and a really interesting perspectives. Um, please also join me thanking our great experts today and also uh, thanking to Odd who has uh, shared uh, lots of the ideas that we produced in the past uh, together with many other organizations. Thank you so much. I wish you a really good um, day and evening. Um, and again, um, let's also stay in touch and um, join the session later this week on the further security of digital products. Thank you.